Ladies and gentlemen, brethren and all, we've come to that poignant moment in time that we've all been waiting for. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the many dignitaries here this evening, both ladies and gentlemen, of course. I especially greet the Deputy Grand Master Elect Right Worshipful Brother Bill Merrill, <laughs> Past Grand Junior Warden Right Worshipful Brother Dario Priori. Oh, the current District Superintendent of Metro District 4, Very Worshipful Brother Gordon Williams. <laughs> Worshipful Brother Alan Wright, who is my uh, QCCC Assistant Secretary. And uh, Brother Alan is an amazing man. I don't wish to embarrass him too much tonight, but he is, of course, a former British commando, served in World War II. Big round of applause for Alan. <laughs> Retired Lieutenant Colonel Adam Vinout. Adam, just put your hand up so we know who you are. <laughs> just hold that applause because Adam, um, he is the Adelaide Hills Citizen of the Year. He is the SA Active Citizen of the Year. And he is the US Bronze Star recipient for bravery. Wow. <laughs> We have, and we've already met him this evening, Major Patrick Trainer of the Royal Australian Corps of Engineers and Chief Engineer for the Multinational Headquarters in Southern Afghanistan during 2019 and 20. <laughs> Some say we're here because Quato Coronati is the world's premier Masonic Lodge of research. They may well be true. Others say it's because of the fine dining experience of the Naval Military and Air Force Club of South Australia. We've just experienced that. Yes. Whilst all these are true, the dominant reason is because of a single man. And great men draw great minds. He is recognised with great distinction in South Australia and the Northern Territory, but in other states, and even around the world, indicated by being a recipient of many accolades, including the Athena Collarette of the Grand Orient of Italy. It's befitting that Stephen speaks tonight about Plato and Freemasonry, his passion for the exploration of knowledge and the deeper mysteries remain a legacy of his many years as a Grand Lecturer. Plato said, and I quote, school teachers have such powers that prime ministers can only dream about. He was, of course, alluding to the power of education. And Stephen is the exception, for he is both a great leader of men as he is a great teacher of men. When a man of Stephen's station in life, experience, charm, wisdom, and great intellect speaks, we listen. And it is my great honour and privilege to give to you the most worshipful brother, the immediate past Grand Master of the ancient, free and accepted Masons of South Australia and the Northern Territory, the most worshipful Stephen Michelin. You have the floor, Stephen. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I feel um, so I'm really the wrong person to be here, uh, having listened to those words of Henning, so I'm hardly those things, but I very much appreciate the, the sentiments behind that. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's very special to be here with you all this evening, um, because this is the uh, inaugural presentation of the Quite a Coronati Correspondent Circle um, in, in South Australia and the Northern Territory, and I'm very, very honoured uh, to have been asked to present this very first presentation. And it's also nice to have you all here as, as our friends, and for us to be able to just 
sit with each other, enjoy each other's company, enjoy the food, enjoy the drink, enjoy the, the fellowship, and just be here and uh, and have a totally different experience than what we usually have. Now, the subject title of this evening's uh, presentation is um, Plato's Philosophy, the Foundation of Modern Freemasonry. Ladies and gentlemen, that sounds very intimidating, and it sounds very highbrow. But in my personal vocation, which is a, a financial advisor, in Australia, we have external compliance audits, which are conducted regularly. And one of the primary uh, objectives of those audits is to make sure to have evidence that we engage with our clients at their own level of financial literacy. So I, I'm confident that this evening I'll be able to transfer that skill uh, to this presentation so that each one of us can feel engaged and included rather than feel as though we're on the outside and listening to something that's very, very foreign. What I've experienced about Freemasonry is its very, very inclusive nature. And sitting here with you all as our friends, I know that we all have different levels of understanding of what Freemasonry is all about. It's history, what it represents, and what its objectives are. So what I'll do this evening is I'll pitch the presentation to a level assuming only a very basic understanding and appreciation of Freemasonry. And for those of you who want something a little bit meatier, I hope to be able to satisfy that as well. So what I'd like to do is suggest that you all relax. Put the problems of the day that you've just had behind you, and for the next 30 minutes or so, allow yourselves to indulge in a new learning experience. I think the best place to start is really to explain what Freemasonry is and what it does. In the first instance, it is a fraternal organisation. In plain English, it means it's an organisation founded on the principles and the concept of brotherhood. We call each other brother. In doing this, we bring to mind that our relationship with each other is marked by being distinctive. It's demonstrated in the way that we act with each other as our brother. We endow each other with our trust, our care, our warm understanding, and our support in times of trial and suffering. But the most important gift that we actually give to each other is our time. In my personal experience of Freemasonry, I've observed that when brothers leave the order, sometimes they leave it because what attracted them to the order in the first instance was the academic concept of brotherhood. But what shocked them was that once they were a brother, they needed to apply those principles in everyday life. It's a shocking thing when all of a sudden you realise that a brother of yours is lying in his deathbed and you come to see him and you give his partner a respite. You may even speak to him in his own language to ease his final suffering. And then you listen to stories that he's told you time and time again when he was an active member of the Order. That's a shocking revelation to go through to demonstrate your brotherhood with that man. Its roots are founded deep in the past. And by when I say that, I'm referring to an organisation that actually had its foundations in the early 1100s. So we're talking about some 900 years ago, when the stonemasons, the actual operative, or I should say fair dinkum stonemasons, were building the cathedrals in Christian Europe. Each project of the cathedral required specialist stonemasonry skills. There were groups of stonemasons who specialised, say, in building a lady chapel, or, a, or specialised in building a tower, or the archways, or a nave. At this point in time, I think it's important to remember that in a medieval trade circle, once you or I were taught the secrets of that trade, we were expected to keep them. 
the welfare of each member of our lodge in our trade was based on the principle that only we understood those secrets. And so the economic welfare of our membership was based on the understanding that we would never divulge, mark, carve, engrave, indict, or otherwise communicate those secrets to any other person. In the time that I've been a member of our order, I can confidently say that it has assisted me to overcome my shyness, especially in the public environment. It's given me opportunities to chair committees, better understand the legal consequences of certain approaches, build a network of friends that I would never, ever have, have had the opportunity to meet, learn how to conduct ritual, learn how to engage confidently with public figures and celebrities, and that's just to name a few. And this has all helped me enormously in my own profession. My wife Jenny is here with us this evening and I think I can also say confidently that her involvement in Freemasonry, which during the time of uh, my time as Deputy and Grand Master, she was at the forefront, has helped her not only as a human being but as a leader in her area overseeing the correct payment of police officers here in South Australia. So from our own personal experience of Freemasonry, we are a testament to the fact that our order offers terms of personal growth and development. Within Freemasonry, there are a number of other associations who manage millions of dollars to provide funding for community projects, medical research, joint ventures with universities, scholarships, and so on. Now, having given you a, a bit of a, an understanding of what Freemasonry really involves in our day and age now, I'd like to go back in history and just have a look at what was actually happening in lodges at the time when our foundations were first put down. Now, going by the various documents and artefacts which have come down to us, we can be reasonably confident that there were three items that formed the basis of, we'll call them lodge meetings, but they were also trade schools. And in their own way, they were also prayer meetings in their own right. We would have been taught the technical aspect of our craft, how to use the tools of our trade, how to construct an arch for a, for a cathedral, for argument's sake. We would have been taught, this is very important, a code of conduct. And the code of conduct was very important because the master of our lodge was employing us on a particular project. If our behaviour was not of a standard that would allow that lodge to continue on, then all of a sudden the welfare of its members would be put at, at risk as well. The other thing is that there was also a ritualistic prayer that was offered to two saints in particular. They were the Saint, Saint John the Baptist and Saint John the Evangelist. And we'll come back to that. Just remember that, don't pay too much attention, but we'll come back to that in, uh, in just a little while. You, or I, you and I would have to swear that we would keep the secrets of our trade secret. That was very important for our economic welfare. We would also swear that our behaviour would entitle us to the continued privilege of belonging to that lodge and having employment at that particular project. And lastly, if you or I failed in either of those two areas, there would be dire consequences. And those dire consequences could mean lack of employment for all the, all the members of the lodge and the way that uh, a brother who perhaps failed in that uh, was treated was, um, uh, was quite dire in, in its consequence. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, that um, by the time that Chaucer was writing, so we're talking about the, uh, say the, uh, moving on to the 1400s, the stonemason's trade was at its pinnacle 
in Europe. There, there were cathedrals, churches, monasteries, priories, priories, convents being built everywhere. But then, what happened by the time of Shakespeare, the Protestant Reformation had taken place. And this Protestant Reformation was a movement that evolved principally in Germany with Martin Luther, who was a Roman Catholic Augustinian monk, and it spread very rapidly throughout Europe. One of the primary tenets of any arm of the Reformation was the belief that in order for you and I to, communi to communicate or commune with our Christian God, we did not have to have elaborate places of worship. So, one of the first economic consequences of that line of thought was that uh, cathedrals, churches, chapels, convents, priories, priories, and monasteries ceased being built in the same manner that they were prior to that. And so what happened is it led to the demise of the stonemason's trade as it was, say, 200 years prior to that. Now, to be really honest, we do not know what happened between, say, 1600 and 1700, that 100 year period, that caused a change from the stonemason's trade itself to become a Masonic organisation, such as you know, we might consider it being now. There are many, many theories about how that happened, and those theories are really outside the scope of this presentation. But what we do know is that in the 1600s, men of very sophisticated learning and high education began to embody the ideals of the Enlightenment. In other words, the Enlightenment was moving away from religious superstition to, um, to, to use reason and thought to be able to understand how the world is. Um, and what they also did is they put together a code, a new code of behaviour in the hope of forming a new society based on the principles of brotherhood instead of religious dogma. And this became known as speculative Freemasonry. The word speculative, ladies and gentlemen, you can substitute it for philosophic Freemasonry. So in other words, instead of picking up tools of trade of a, of a stonemason, we use those tools of trade to be able to think, how would we use this in order to fashion our lives in a way of our behaviour within society. Now, on the evening of the 24th of June, 1717, representatives of lodges who were meeting in London decided to approve an administrative um, model known as Grand Lodge. And one of the primary functions of this new Grand Lodge was to bring cohesion to the way that Freemasonry was being practiced in London at that time. And it's of interest, ladies and gentlemen, that the 24th of June is a very, very special day to the early stonemasons themselves, because that was the feast day of St. John the Baptist. Now, imagine living back in those days where we didn't have calendars on the wall, we didn't have um, smart watches to tell us what day of the week it was and what day of the month it was, what we would do is we would go, um, say, to church to celebrate the, the feast day of St John the, uh, the Baptist and understand the 24th of June is as good a mark as any for the summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere. And then, correspondingly, on the 27th of December, Six months later, we would use that as the market to remind us this was the winter solstice for us in the Northern Hemisphere as well. Within a short period of time, this cohesion had turned into a schism. Despite the fact that there were attempts made to bring about cohesion, there were divisions that were already happening within Freemasonry. And most of these divisions were caused around what opposition Freemasons saw as the watering down 
of the ritual, as well as revolutionary changes in the membership criteria. The original network of Freemasons prior to 1717 was Christian. So that meant you and I had to be Christians in order to be a member of the society. But in the 1720s, this Grand Lodge revolutionised that membership criteria. They changed the wording and said, membership is open to any man who professes a belief in a supreme being. And what this did was, very cleverly, it opened the door to allow many Jewish businessmen to join. And it was, it was, it was architected in that particular way in order to bring in extra money that was required at that particular time. But that didn't sit well with all Freemasons. Remembering the times, the British Empire was just beginning to burgeon. And all of a sudden, to think that I, as a Freemason, has to sit next to a Hindu or a Buddhist, and he's not of the same caliber as I am, of the same race as I am, unfortunately, that wasn't the way that they really wanted things done. So there was a splitting, a schism that was taking place within the order. And that schism continued until 1813. And what happened was, in 1813, both Grand Lodges, by that stage, they got together and they agreed on terms of unification. So when you hear um, Brother Heading get up and talk about the United Grand Lodge of England, the united part of that term refers to the unification of these two great Grand Lodges themselves. Now, it's at this point that um, I began to develop a theory some 15 years ago as to how all of this happened and how what we are today, the Freemasonry that we enjoy, how that actually came to be. In 1977, I was uh, attending Murray Park Teachers College. And in that same year, at the same college, was a bloke called Anthony Lapalia, who was also with me as a student in the drama class that we were going to. I didn't know Anthony Lapalia, and I'm sure he doesn't know who I am either at this particular time. But one of the textbooks that I studied was this book here, Plato's Republic. And that, this one, is the actual book that I studied. I had parked that inside a box and left it up in the ceiling for a great number of years. And in 2004, I was clearing away the boxes, found this book, and started to thumb through it. And as I was thumbing through it, I could see that I had underlined and I had used um, uh, a highlighter, and as I was looking through those words, all of a sudden it occurred to me how many of those words were familiar to me in the ritual that I use as a Freemason. And we're not talking about just simply one little sentence. We're talking about slabs throughout that book, Plato's Republic, that echoes the sentiments. It, it made the hairs on the back of my neck just prickle to, uh, to, to read that. What I wanted to do was to find out why um, this would have been the case. So for the next three years, I took various vectors of, of research in my own time, simply to, to, um, to satisfy a curiosity of my own. So. Perhaps what we'll do is we'll start off just talking about why I was actually um, at that particular stage reading uh, or studying Plato's Republic. As a student learning, as a student teacher, we were, we were reading Plato's Republic because this was the very first man in Western society who proposed a cohesive system of education, and he did this 400 years before the Christian era. But his system itself 
ladies and gentlemen, was revolutionary because it didn't teach a person what to think. It taught them how to think. And its goal was to educate a person to become a thinking leader. The term that, that Plato used was philosopher king. A very distinguished term of a thinking leader. Plato was so well ahead of his time, ladies and gentlemen. He proposed that a thinking leader didn't have to be a man. It could be a woman. The, 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 the thing that made a, a person a thinking leader was their ability to actually produce the result, not simply their gender. And his writings proposed the idea of meritocracy. So in other words, um, you merit a promotion. Interestingly, how many times in a Masonic ritual we come across this concept of the fact that you, a brother has been given a particular um, position because he has merited that position because of his service to the order itself. Now, Plato wrote this book as a response to the execution of his friend, mentor, and possibly lover, uh, Socrates, and Socrates was put to death in 399 years before the Christian era. Now the government in Athens at that time was democratic and Plato loathed democracy, loathed it completely. From his perspective, democracy was nothing more than mob rule. The mob were not educated. They wouldn't be educated to be able to put his friend to death. So for the rest of his life, Plato was focused on finding a system that would enable these sort of executions never ever to occur again. He didn't like the idea of smooth talkers. In Greek, uh, in, Greek in Greece at that time, they were known as uh, rhetoricians, and they were simply smooth talkers. Smooth talkers had moved the mob to execute his friend. And he wanted to make sure that this never happened again, that people were able to make their own decision because they could think, and they could think clearly. Plato's term for the thinking leader was a philosopher king. And um, probably the best example of a philosopher king in actual life in ancient times was Marcus Aurelius. And here we've got a photo of um, Richard Harris playing Marcus Aurelius in the movie Gladiator. Marcus Aurelius also wrote this book. It's a slim book known as The Meditations. And if you've ever read that book, it is amazing how by reading the, the very small paragraphs, it imbues you with this, this majesty, this, the, the prose, it, it's, it's inspiring. Um, so if you've never, never read that book, I really um, I suggest that perhaps pick it up and you can, you can simply flip to any page and read something and I'll, I'll, I could put my hand over my heart and tell, tell you the words will punch you and you'll say, wow, that is something absolutely amazing. Plato's ideal society was founded on one thing, to get people who are rulers to be philosophers, to be thinking people, or to get the people who are thinking people in our society to take office and lead by their example. His educational system was based on two revolutionary approaches. And these approaches, ladies and gentlemen, if you are a Freemason, you will identify so very quickly. The very first one was that he promoted the liberal 
arts and sciences as the academic or the mind training uh, ground to become a philosopher king. Now, for those of you who are not aware of what the liberal arts and sciences are, the arts themselves, the arts being grammar, logic, and rhetoric, those three arts were the, were the disciplines of language. And they're important because as a leader, we have to be able to, to know, to be able to put words in a sequence that is intelligible. And that is grammar. We need to put those sentences into a format which makes sense, and that's logic. And then we've got to use those sentences and be able to deliver it, deliver it, um, deliver it in a in a public forum so that we can move people to action. They were very, very important disciplines as far as Plato was concerned, as a basis to become a philosopher king. He also proposed the sciences to be the disciplines of calculation. So on the one side, we have to know how to speak, how to lead by the words that we use. But we also need to have the disciplines in our mind to be able to calculate. And those disciplines of calculation are arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Now, I can imagine you might say, well, Stephen, how is it that music and astronomy have got anything to do with calculation? Well, when we really think about it, astronomy is nothing more than the, the science of the measurement of heavenly bodies, and music is nothing more than the measurement of sound intervals and frequencies. So he put together this, this intellectual program, this academic program, on the one side. So that's the liberal arts and sciences. And guess what? Within our sonic order, one of the first things we are taught is to apply those liberal arts and sciences in our own lives. Now, secondly, he proposed the cardinal virtues as the character building aspect of a philosopher king. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a look at the photo, there are four beautifully dressed ladies. And artistically, they represent each of the four cardinal virtues. Now, these cardinal virtues, again, they come from Plato's thinking. The four cardinal virtues are prudence or in modern language, we'd say, using your practical sense. Temperance, or the application of self-control, balanced thinking. Fortitude, or courage, or the application of correct thinking about what frightens us when we think about things. And lastly, the application of justice. And we're not talking about justice that happens in the court, but justice in terms of how do we deal with people that we ordinarily meet. Someone does something well, the just thing is you praise them. Someone does something that is not quite right, what do you do? To be just, you correct them. So they were the two, two major platforms of the education of a thinking leader that, um, that Plato had proposed. If you go into the Simpson room in uh, Grand Lodge in, in Adelaide, you'll find this, um, the, this checkered uh, floor work there. And the most important thing, if this works, is on the corner of each, each of the corners of this uh, pavement, there is a tassel. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there, you'll have to believe me, and there's one there. Each of those tassels represents one of the four cardinal virtues. So when a Freemason walks into his lodge, the first thing he does, excuse me for picking that up, the first thing he does is he looks at that and he reminds himself that my life, the way that I have to demonstrate in the way that I live my life, I need to demonstrate those four cardinal virtues. 
in ancient Greek thought, if you or I confidently demonstrated those four cardinal virtues in our lives, we were living a life of excellence. And they call that a rate. And that means virtue. But it really doesn't mean virtue from the way that we know it in English. It means a habit of excellence. And I think that's a, it's a remarkable thing to be able to, uh, um, to consider that and think that from all those many, many years ago, it's come down to us and that is what we practice as, uh, as, uh, as Freemasons in our lives. So, to summarise, Plato's curriculum for educating a person to become a philosopher king incorporated a study of the liberal arts and sciences, and that was the mind training, and the practice of the cardinal virtues, which was how do I deal in my life with you? How do I deal with problems? How do I deal with, with conflicts that happen between you and me? I need to apply those, those four cardinal virtues in order to demonstrate that I'm living a life of human excellence. Interestingly, in Freemasonry, from the night that we are initiated, our objective is actually to achieve the, care, the chair of King Solomon. That is the expression that we use. By saying that, I'll take, put it into non-Mason speak. It means, I want to be guided to become the president of my lodge, the worshipful master of my lodge, to, be, to get the chair of King Solomon. Let's just have a look at what King Solomon is all about. King Solomon was a lover of wisdom. If there's anything we know about King Solomon, he was a wise man. There's always that story about the, the two women fighting over a child and, you know, um, no one knew how to, how to settle the dispute and he said, give me a sword. And he said, I'll cut the child and you can each have a half. And the mother said, please don't do that. Whatever happens, don't do that. And he said, well, you're the mother. The one that didn't cry out was not the mother. He was a wise man. So he was a lover of wisdom. Interestingly, in Greek, a lover of wisdom is philosophos, a philosopher. And he was also a king. He was a philosopher king. So in our own way, when we aspire to, to gain the chair of King Solomon, we have codified the teaching of Plato to say, over a period of time, we will be guided to become a thinking leader, a philosopher king, a worshipful master of our lodge. Now, as we need to start wrapping this up, it's important to get some appreciation as to why this would have happened. Why did they choose Plato? Well, in the late 1700s to the early 1800s, there was a, a cultural fad that was going throughout England and Germany. Academics call it Philhellenism, which simply means love of all things that are Greek. In England in particular, poetry, art, music, literature, all had ancient Greek influences. Now to just give you some, an example or two, Lord Byron, poet extraordinaire, fellow of the Royal Society, at the tender age of 36, he died in Greece from a, from a bullet wound fighting the Turks for the freedom of Greece. His last dying words were, when I am no longer breathing, take a knife and cut out my heart and bury it here in Greece. Take the rest of my body, transport it to London, do whatever you like. So they pickled his body after they took out his heart and buried it, and then laid him to rest in um, in, uh, in, in London. There's also 
Lord Elgin. Now, this Lord Elgin was a bit of a trickster. In the 1830s, he had a look at the Parthenon and saw the beautiful friezes there. He went to the, to the uh, Greek government and said, do you know these Turks you're fighting right now? If they turn on you, the first thing they're going to go for is the Parthenon. It'll, by destroying the Parthenon, that will be their way of showing that they have subjugated you. So I'll tell you what I reckon you should do. Allow me and my team to get some scaffolding up. We'll take away all the freezers. We'll take them back to London. And what we'll do is we'll protect them for you. Well, the funny thing is, and between the Greek government and the English government, that is still a very, very tickly subject because they want their freezers back. You may have heard of a, a Greek actress called Melina Mercuri. Um, uh, I forget the movie, but she was in uh, with Alan Bates in, in 1961. Anyway, Melina Mercuri, what she did was she protested actively for the return of those freezers. Um, unfortunately, that still never occurred. And the, the odes of Keats, Wordsworth and Shelley, odes themselves were an ancient Greek structure of poetry. It was a structure of poetry that had been lost. But all of a sudden during this fad, it came alive again. And isn't it interesting that as Freemasons, when we are in Lodge, we do not sing hymns. In every single case, without exception, we sing odes. Just an interesting little um, little aside. Oh, and sorry, there's one last thing. There's a um, uh, German, Heinrich Schliemann who was so fascinated by Greek history that he decided that he would find Homer's Troy. He spent years and years and years and finally found it amongst many, many other treasures as well. So, for me, the nail in the coffin of this argument rests with this very meek-looking gentleman. His name is Thomas Tyler. Now, Thomas Tyler translated the complete works of, Sha of, uh, of Shakespeare, of Plato. And he did that by 1804. Remember the year, 1804. In 1804, if we could read and speak English for the first time in history, we could pick up any book of Plato's and we could understand it. Five years later, in 1809, the Lodge of Reconciliation, which was a lodge put together with academics, scholars from both of the opposing Grand Lodges, were put into this lodge and told, find a way to unify the ritual that is pulling us apart. So five years after this, all of a sudden these guys get together and uh, they put together the new ritual that we use here in South Australia. And this ritual that they put together, ladies and gentlemen, is known as emulation. And in 1836, when South Australia was founded, the men who came aboard those ships here to the shores of South Australia were Freemasons. And they carried with them the first charter or license to practice Freemasonry in South Australia. They practiced the emulation ritual. And guess what? The foundation of the city of Adelaide itself was based on the Sonic principles, including the shape and the strength, the strength, the way that the strength themselves of Adelaide were put together. But that Ladies and gentlemen, that is a, um, that's a, uh, it's, it's a presentation for another time and another day. So my argument is this, that the evolution of modern Masonic ritual that's based on the emulation ritual of 1813 
was shaped by the Philhellenic fad that overtook England and Germany for about 40 or 50 years, and as it, at, at its core was the philosophy of Plato. So, on behalf of the members of Ottawa Cor Coronati Correspondence Circle here in South Australia and Northern Territory, I just want to say thank you very, very much for coming here this evening, for sharing your friendship or fellowship with us, and for helping us to promote what we do best, and that is promote brotherhood. So thank you very, very much for coming.